Now, how many of you are ready for the word of God right now? Let's get ready for the word. Amen. Nobody like you, Lord. Proverbs 5. Proverbs 5. 15 through 21. I don't know why y'all sat down. You know how we do. You know how we do. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 through 21. 1, 2, 3, read. Amen. Some of y'all looking like, is this in the Bible? It's talking about body parts. And some of y'all say, I'll do my devotions this week like I'm, uh, I'm going to be up in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Let's go before the King of Kings. Father, we thank you um, for you in some way covering every life issue. Whether in principle, overtly or covertly, you communicate something that touches every area of life. And like Paul said in uh, Acts 20, he said, I have not shrank back from preaching to you the whole counsel of God, and your blood is not on my hands. That's how I want to leave here, Lord God. I want to preach every crack and crevice of the text so that people are accountable and committed to knowing and understanding what you think on everything. So, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer in whom we trust. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. And this will be our next installment. Here is, in our manhood series, is sexual enjoyment. Somebody say sexual enjoyment. Sexual enjoyment. At, at the second service, almost. Say, say to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. I was like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> so I was like, not today. Not today. That may not go off well. So I said, um, <laughs> so we had, you know, <clears throat> so... So forgive me uh, today in advance. I I I I'm 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 being um uh, uh, a sanctified blunt. All right. So y'all heard that right? Now when I say sanctified blunt, I ain't talking about trashy. I'm talking about biblically informative. <laughs> um, and I, but however, I am trying to be careful with my words, so there'll be awkward pauses. To I almost said something in the early the first ser second service, and they laughed really, really badly, so amen, I didn't say it. It wasn't bad, it just wasn't good timing, amen, amen. Um, next, next um, we have children upstairs. For kids at a certain age, as they are listening at the first service, sister brought a child in and was covering her ear, I was like, you know, that's why we didn't, that's why we got upstairs, and so um, we, we wanna make sure that um, we're not engaging children for you. That's number one. Um, and particularly too early, um, but we know that, you know, e even in no matter what school, suburban or urban or rural, they're learning about things at a very, very early age. <clears throat> so some people may say, hey, I want my child in here so that they can be engaged with what we're teaching at home in a way to be a supplement to what we are trying to do here. So um, as we talk today, this is going to be an enjoyable message. So um, I, 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 I think it's going to be enjoyable. And so... Um, so sexual enjoyment. Fellas, a few questions. Ladies, it'll hit you, but this is mainly for the fellas. You get the residue today. A women's series coming in the spring. Here we go. <clears throat> fellas, where did you first hear about sex? Don't answer loud. Like, just, that's a rhetorical question. Like, I don't want to hear nothing. I'm just asking you to bring that up in your mind. Amen. I want you to bring that up in your mind. Um, next is... <clears throat> When were you first introduced to porn? Was your first introduction to sex from God's perspective or from a fallen perspective? Next question. How many times a day 
Are you lusting and thinking about sex? I know that's impossible to count. Um, y'all can loosen. Hold on, take a deep breath, y'all. Y'all, the, you can cut the tension with like one, two, three. D in, out. No, well, one more again. In, out. Do 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 you, Mr. Miyagi? In, out. That's my favorite. He he he's dope at that. All right. <clears throat> do you have the gift of singleness? Everybody quiet on that one. At the second service, they yelled no. Um, I was like, it was a rhetorical question. I just wanted to answer it. No. (laughs) The gift of singleness is a supernatural gift to resist sexual urges in order to glorify God through dedicating yourself fully to the Lord in some particular way outside of marriage, right? And so if you don't have supernatural sexual self-control, you probably don't have the gift of singleness. A to the doggone men. All right. I've only met a few of those in my life, and I praise God for what he has given me. I'm going to read this, what I wrote here today, a few things. All of these questions are pressing questions for me. In a day of casual sex, and a lot of available sisters even, um, porn availability and the normalizing of bisexuality, to me, male sexuality is at an all-time fog right now. Uh, In a world that is, for example, uh, those of you who are gay or bi, I'm not shaming you, I'm not, or trying to fix your sexual preference and attraction by preaching uh, heterosexual, uh, heterosexuality in marriage. I'm preaching this because all men need their sexual DNA code rewritten. So it's interesting <coughs> that in the Bible, <coughs> um, there is a, um, a, 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 a hermeneutical principle called the law of first mentions. <coughs> law of first mentions is when something's mentioned, a theological concept or an idea is mentioned and explained for the first time, it dictates how it's used through the rest of the Bible. Um, Genesis chapter one, verse Uh, 28 mentions be fruitful and multiply. That's God in the context of a lot of good stuff talking about sex. And so therefore, the the order of how God talks about sex, I mean, God didn't wait, God didn't wait two pages before he started talking about sex. He started talking about sex in the very, very, very beginning, which means (laughs) in in, in the context, sex is mentioned in the context of the creation narrative and it's, and it's said in the context of, and, it, and it's God saw it, and it was good, and it was good. God also sees <laughs> marital sex, and he sees it as good. So as we look at that reality and let the law of first mentions sort of frame how we view everything and, and, and view things, I want to read something from a great book that I peered into on and off over this. It's a pretty thick book. Um, but I, I like one of the things that he says about God honoring sex. He said, God honoring sex is pleasing. It pleases God and it pleases us, which is, which is exactly what God intends. He cared, talking about God, <clears throat> so much about making sex pleasing that he wrapped physical pleasure, emotional satisfaction, psychological fulfillment, and spiritual meaning into one complex relationship. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? So, so check this out. So what does sex involve? I want to give you some, some pre-points so that we can frame God's purposes. Somebody say God's purposes. All right. God, good sex involves procreation. Genesis chapter 128 means the creation of other human beings. Um, it also involves connection. The, 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 the just needing to connect on every level with a spouse. That's Genesis 223 through 25. Consummation. It's Exodus 22 and Deuteronomy 22. You can also rewrite that Genesis 2 passage beside it. Talking about oneness, consummation, the the initiation of a union. Okay? Uh, uh, um, Not only that, it's for recreation. Amen. Amen. Just flat foot enjoyment. It don't have to always be about procreation. Sometimes it could just be about some good old recreation. Amen. (laughs) Come on, y'all. Loosen up now. I'm in the Bible. It's not like I'm making something up. Am I making anything up? Okay, I'm just asking now. Song of Solomon, the whole book. It's just about recreation. 
I climbed my gazelle. I was like, God dang it, Solomon. <laughs> Bathsheba talking about, I looked through the bushes. I was like, whoa. But the Bible talks about sex in very, very enjoyable ways. Um, for free, in your marriage, you can just read a chapter of Song of Solomon. That's foreplay right there. Amen. Told you I'm going to be real today. Y'all be mad at me if you want. It's all in the book. Last thing is for protection. 1 Corinthians uh, 7 talks about you, don't be taking long breaks from sex with each other. It says come together lest the devil get involved. Because the devil loves to get in sexless marriages. It's unbiblical to have a sexless marriage. Having a sexless marriage is a sign of a lot of breakdowns on every level of the marital relationship. Now, there are times, I'm not talking about fasting, where maybe one of the spouses is down because of illness or sickness or something like that. But if it's willful, a willful disposition of denying your spouse sex, that is from the devil, the pit of hell, and all kinds of demonic possession. I just want to give it the worst kind of label I really can. All right? Sexlessness is on plan. So I got one point. <laughs> I got one point, and I think it's the best sermon point that's ever been created in the history of preaching. <laughs> that's why it's only one point. I mean, it's a mic drop point, pretty much legendary already. Um, when you hear it, fellas, you're going to be like, that's, that is the best point I've ever heard in my life. Best point. This is GOAT status right here. Here we go. Men must be freed to enjoy great, frequent sex in marriage to one godly woman. Fellas, ain't that the best point you ever heard in your life? Somebody say frequent. <laughs> Pastor Kerr said, say great. <laughs> All of those adjectives. They was given extra adjectives at the second century. Great, enjoyable, unbelievable, ecstatic. I was like, all right, y'all. All right, all right. Let me preach a sermon. <laughs> so I think it's a freedom to enjoy good sex. The Bible teaches that. And I want singles to think that way. Look at verse 15. He says, drink water from your own. Somebody say your own. Drink water from your own cistern and water flowing from your own. Somebody say your own. Your own well. I like this. Drink water here is interesting because it's used as a euphemism. Like A lot of the wisdom literature is written in figurative language. And so it's speaking figuratively of the man's sexual desire or thirst for something, rather. So, so here when it talks about drink water, it's talking about going to a place to, to, to soothe a thirst you have. And he says, just as you would soothe a thirst, if you're thirsty, you go get some water. You ever, you, ever, you ever drank some fruit punch when you were thirsty? Y'all better preach the sermon for me. Amen. <laughs> when, when, when you start drinking stuff that ain't what actually replenishes what's supposed to be replenished, you're still thirsty. So see how here in the text he says drink water. And so drinking water, just as drinking water restores your thirst, I mean restores your, uh, uh, replenishes you, is the same way that sex is supposed to be in marriage. Sex is supposed to be a legitimate outlet to enjoy being refreshed all over again in the marital relationship. You can say amen whenever you want to. And be, uh, uh, um, it's interesting here because several things that we see in this whole idea uh, uh, of this. He says, drink water. Then he gives you the source. It's singular. Drink water from your own cistern. Water flowing from your own well. I like that. It's cistern and well, synonymous parallelism here is what it's called. And this synonymous parallelism is saying the same thing twice by emphasizing it, by saying it in different ways to emphasize the depth of the way in which the, 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 the writer is trying to emphasize what that place and what he wants you to do. So cistern is hewn usually in rock, stone, and it takes work to build out a cistern. A cistern, you build it in the ground and you put pitch around it so that it wouldn't seep into the rock. And what you would do is you would, you would dig that and make sure that it was open. But, but, but one thing you could, you, you, could, you could hew the cistern, but one thing you couldn't do is put water in it. 
In the ground, you dig a well, dig a well in the ground, and you put brick stone around it. You put pitch around it if you want to. Water has to get in there. But the issue is the thing that you, the responsibility of the builder and the investor is to invest in building it, but they can't get water. They have to trust God to put what's needed to refresh them in it. Marriage is the same way. Men have to invest in making sure the wife as a cistern is built up and developed in a way so that God can put in her what he called to have in her to properly refresh him. Oh, God, I'm by myself. That's good preaching if I ever heard it in my life. Well, and that means that means that the sexual relationship between a husband and wife is an investment. That means, fellas, you got to invest in making sure that your wife can be a good refreshing place for you. It's not all about waiting for her to refresh you. It's about making sure she has what's needed in her life for you to be refreshed. So it's a reciprocating relationship. Oh, somebody ought to say amen right there. And so what's beautiful about the way in which God, and we'll break that down even more later, is that here, it, it, it lets me know a lot. It lets me know, and oh, 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 this is, this is also it. And so notice he said your own. That means the goal is you don't put your bucket in your well and then take your little bucket over here to somebody else's well, put it in there. Ain't no telling who been in there. And then take your little bucket and go back home to the cistern, putting it in there, adding to it all kinds of stuff with God knows who been welling it up over here, and now you're bringing all of that mess to the cistern that God wanted you to invest in to only have the water that he provides, so you're going somewhere else to get water when God has already got water at home. I'm by myself. So, 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 so let me just tell you this, a few things. Sexual de desire is legitimate. Hear me. Sexual desire is legitimate. Let, don't let the devil make you think that sexual desire is evil. That's one of the biggest lies. God created you with the desire to have sex. Let's break it down. God created you with the ability to be horny. Horniness is not a sin. Please hear me today. I want you to let that sit on you because many of us don't think of it that way because of the outlets that our horniness executes itself in. So don't equate the outlet with the desire. That's, that's key. And because when God changes and he transforms how you view your sexual desire, it's not based on the feeling you get when you illegitimately use an outlet that's off limits. Because if you let the conviction of the Holy Spirit from the bad outlet make you view that the Holy Spirit doesn't like sex, it's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't like sex. He doesn't like what you're using to fulfill the passions that God has given you. That's very important. So stop demonizing your desire for sex. Scrutinize the outlet, though. You need to scrutinize the outlet. We're going to talk about some of those in a minute. And so as we look down and we look at all that God has for us, one of the problems with going to cisterns that aren't your own is what ends up happening is when you don't use your centralized cistern, um, what, what ends up happening is you, you, you bring to your cistern other cisterns that you had in the past. So what ends up happening is, is because many men think that having five and ten conquests, knockdowns, smashes, whatever you want to call it, right? You think that's cool, but you're only trying one trick on ten people. So anybody, this is in the text, anybody can look good if they're trying one trick on one person. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 through 25, it says the two shall become one. Why is that important? Because oneness also, remember, involves procreation, recreation, uh, 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 and protection. So when you go into, when, when you have sex with one person, if, you, if you're going to multiple people, you don't have to grow with them. God's desire originally was for two virgins to come to the table with no knowledge but great expectations. That, that was the purpose. The purpose wasn't 
for you to say, well, you know, shorty back in college, the way she used to get down, you know, do you, you know, nah, that's evil in the sight of the Lord. Because now you're trying to, you're trying to bring fake ungodly oneness into your house when you don't know where she is sexually. The, the goal is that y'all don't touch each other sexually till you get married. So that you can have the climactic enjoyment, not only of the honeymoon night, but of growing and developing together in the sexual union for a lifetime and learning over time without the pressure of performing based on how somebody else was endowed or how, uh, how somebody else made her yell. No, it's based on what God has placed you two together for so that you can focus on developing and growing together in oneness and learning the contours of one another's body. What are the likes and what are the dislikes? That's biblical sex. That's why in the Bible, that's why in the Bible, sex is, that's why God compares sex to idolatry. That's why it's always called adultery. Because the relationship that a husband has with the wife is parallel to the relation that all of us have with the Lord. In other words, whenever you step out on the Lord, you're being unfaithful. And so the singular relationship and commitment that you're supposed to have in oneness with the Lord is with him. But then in the marriage relationship, it's the same thing. Right. And so when we look at that idea of <coughs> what Adam said, Adam, I love what Adam said. Adam said. And Adam said to the woman, God didn't even ask him to talk. <laughs> That's how you know he saw something. He wasn't like permission to speak. You know, he saw the woman and said this one at last. So that means he'd been looking around. He'd been naming animals. He's like, nah, lion, <laughs> elephant. Walrus. Ugh. He's just going all over the place, naming them. Then he takes a nap, wakes up. This one. At last. He said, bone of my bone. Mm-hmm. And flesh of my flesh. <laughs> he started hooping, Doc. He said, for she was taken from man. This is why she... He said, he said, man, you so fine. A man should leave his father and mother and be bound to you, his wife, and the two shall become one. Listen, that's how you should be about, listen, this is what he did in a world with only one woman. This is the same thing you should be able to do in a world with other women. Treat the one woman like there's no other women in the world because you've seen all kinds of stuff pass you by. I'm by myself. <laughs> and that's the beauty of the marital bond and relationship, right? So, so look at what it says. <coughs> Here, it says, verse 16. It says, should your springs, oh God, flow in the streets, streams in <clears throat> the public squares, now this is this is gully right here. I don't know if y'all say that no more. We say that back in the day, <laughs> gully. Um, so what he's saying, he remember the last verse, verse fifteen was a synonymous parallelism. <clears throat> if you take verse fifteen and put it up against verse sixteen, it's a contrasting parallelism. Okay, so it takes two opposing concepts with parallel ideas and show you how different they are. Remember in verse fifteen, cistern and well were singular. But look here, springs and streams is plural. Why? Because here he's talking about just being all over the place with your sexual desire. And so he said, why should you, in other, word, in other words, cisterns and wells are on, usually on private property, meaning you only had access to it. Sp uh, springs and streams, everybody been drinking from that. No cat, just go up, just drink, walk away. You understand? Know just drinking. Everybody just got availability to it. <clears throat> but back then, you wouldn't just walk up on somebody's property trying to get up in their cistern. You get towed up. He's like, you come over to my cistern if you want to. You better fall back, homie, right? But nobody says anything when the streams are such, because streams are common. <clears throat> let, let, me, let me just say something to you, ladies. Don't be common. Don't be common. Know what's common? Can I say this? You get mad at me, send me an email. I'll love on you anyway. I'll give it to Sarita. She'll handle you. So, 
Let me tell you something. Listen. Like, leave something to the imagination on social media. Just because you go to the beach and just because you lost some weight, do not go to the two-piece ministry. I'm just telling y'all. If dudes see you thonged up online, don't get mad at me because dudes ain't going to tell you. Dudes ain't feeling it. They, gon', they, gon', they, gon', they, they may slip up in your DMs or something else, but guess what they won't slip on? No ring. And so listen, dudes kind of want somebody that's not out there. Because I know I wouldn't want my wife all out there in pictures, you know, doing, doing the situation. You know what I'm saying? Going all like that. Hips all out. I'm just being honest. So help the brothers out. Amen. Amen. And so when we look at this idea of springs being in the streets, he's talking about limited in those things. So what he does is this interesting. Father's talking to son. As the father's talking to the son, the, uh, uh, this is Solomon talking to Rehoboam, teaching him about being a king. In the first part of the chapter, he talks to him about the wayward woman. <coughs> in, the, in, the latter, in, the, in this part of the chapter, he talks about the type of woman you should want to marry. So from 5 through chapter 7, he, he's, he, it's interesting how much this book talks about good women. It's, it, the, the book of Proverbs talks a lot about good women. Chapter 5 through 7, and then Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. And so, and so when you look at that, that's beautiful, right? But, but what's interesting here textually is when you go back, what he gives you, this is some real, like, this is some street stuff he about to put on. He about to put on mad game right now. Now, I'm just about to prepare you for the type of game my man is up on. Look at verses 8 through 10. He says in verse 8 through 10 of chapter 5, he said, keep your way far from her. Talking about the wayward woman. He said, don't slip up in her DMs. How do I know? He said, don't go near the door of her house. That sounds like DMs and going over a crib, all that. Don't, he said, no Netflix and chill. <laughs> Amen. He's, he said, don't go near her. He said, because, fellas, if you go near her, you, 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 yeah, yeah. You said it, brother. It's a wrap. Because the forbidden woman is always fine. He, the way he talked about it, he said, the lips drip like honey. The way he talked about it, he said, Solomon, you're making this sound better, so you better be careful. And then he goes here, but he said, yes, yeah, she looks good, but that's all she is. He, said, he, he says, you don't want to marry a woman that all she is is her body. He said, don't go near her house. Then look what he says in verse 9. He says, otherwise, this is deep. This is deep Hebrew language right here. Otherwise, you will give up your vitality to others and your years to, the, to someone cruel. What is, he, what is he saying? Vitality is your best sexual years. Okay, there, there's a season. <clears throat> there's a season you got that you, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> I'm in the Bible, y'all. Don't think I'm, I'm not making this up. He said, your years, he, your early years, that's why he talks about the wife of your youth. Because they, they, that's them years where your movement is fluid. <laughs> I'm in the book, y'all. And so he says, he said, those years where you should be building sexual oneness and knowing her and her knowing you should be spent with her, not all over the place. He said, because when you get old, you get to live off of what you can't do no more. He said, because listen, women have sex here before they have sex here. So you got to give her a trajectory of memory. Because when you get old post-menopause, things change. <laughs> Only the season saints know what I'm talking about now. Y'all, everybody else lost. What's menopause? What's the <laughs> Google? Siri, what's, what's perimenopause? <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but your vigor, your testosterone goes down later. The Bible already knew that. I had a 75-year-old man pouring into me a little bit. He's talking, and he got around to talking about sex. I was, like, I, got, 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 got. I was like, don't be talking to me. Disciple me in money. I don't want to hear about how you doing in the bedroom. He said, I'm telling you. It don't be over when you get by. You know, they be doing them dances and can't, you know, going there. I'm like, I don't know what he doing, dog. He like, he like, shoot, I'm still getting it in. 
<laughs> He's like, your boy to die. Bang, bang, bang. I'm like, stop, 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 stop. I'm like, stop, help me, Lord, right? Like, help me, help me. That's too much. <laughs> but what I liked about what he was saying to me is he said, you can still enjoy sex even when you're older. That was sweet for me, right? And, but, 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 but he's letting us understand. But then it gets realer than real right here. He said in verse 10, he says, strangers will drain your resources. And your hard-earned pay will end up in a foreigner's house. Child support. Y'all ain't know that was in the Bible, did you? Child support in the Bible. You, you done had your fun, but you got five babies out of wedlock, and you got a good job, you don't got your education, but then 2500 a month going to child support, plus taxes on it. So you got to get that money and pay taxes on, not what you sent, but on the money that you didn't send, that you need to pay that you did send. See? That's why the Bible's trying to tell us, don't be wilding out. And that's why he says, like, stay away from strange, strange situations. Y- y'all remember pay, who remember pay phones? Some of y'all remember pay, y'all don't remember no pay phones, man. Little Gen Z time, I remember, you don't remember no pay phones. I'm just messing with you. You ever went in a phone booth? You, 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 if you, I know, you ever, I'm talking about the ones outside. They done wrote a graffiti all on it, earwax all on the thing. You know, um, you know somebody, Done, 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 went to the bathroom in the thing, and you're scared to put your finger in for the quarter. You don't know what's in there. You don't know what's in there. <coughs> but you're willing to make a call, and you're like, hello? You know, it's a way. You know what I'm saying? Why, why do you feel that way? Because everybody been in there. But now you like your cell phone, don't you? Because you can control who's on that. See, that, that's, that's what... That's, that's the beauty of marriage. Marriage is like a cell phone versus a phone booth. Marriage is supposed to be that personal touch that you get with your mate, with your spouse. Let's rewrite our minds with that kind of truth. Verse 17, he said, they should be for you alone. Talking about your passions or your streams, your desires, alone. And not uh, for, for you to share with strangers. You know, this is the interesting thing about this. You know, a lot of people, you know, that's why porn is a problem and masturbation is a problem. Y'all quiet. Somebody's looking at me like masturbation ain't in the Bible. It is. Matthew chapter 16, he says, if you look at a woman lust on her, you've committed adultery already in your heart. They said, that's not, a, that's not masturbation. Then he says right after that, if your hand causes you to sin. How do I know it's masturbation? Because you're not touching nobody else. You're just looking. Y'all got real quiet on that part. So why is porn so destructive? Because porn teaches you to be sexually selfish. And it trains you to be the one minute man. Because masturbation is for the climax. You're not trying to be intimate with your hand. I gotta keep it straight with y'all. With a human being in marriage, you're trying to be intimate. With, with, with your hand, you're just trying to climax and get it over with, which trains you sexually not to be able to enjoy another person. And then what ends up happening with porn is say the woman in the porn, porno flick is voluptuous physically, and, 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 and top heavy, back heavy, whatever you like, right? And you're into that, and then it's a lot of screaming and hollering. Then you get married, and your wife isn't as voluptuous as that woman. And you can't enjoy her body because you have the picture of somebody else's made up silicone body in your face and, and you can't even appreciate nothing real and God gave you some yes she got a few roles that you you wouldn't have known about nothing you supposed to enjoy every part of her she got a roll here roll there kiss everything amen I know pastor crazy I'm crazy because I believe in godly sex and you're supposed to be enjoying that woman you that's why you need porn causes you to depreciate the value of your own bedroom and the woman that God wants you to be with and have eyes only for her. Listen, God wants to create the image of your wife in your mind as the only person you're attracted to and the only body type you have. What porn does is it trains you. And listen, all that hollering, listen. The dude just come in the room and just throw, throw stuff off and they just get at it. That don't happen. 
Like, that ain't normal. Like, he goes in for an interview, and next thing you know, he's having sex with the interviewer. Like, porn, <laughs> porn is crazy, yo. I'm just saying, you know, that thing is crazy. He go to Chick-fil-A or whatever. I'm, I'm just like, this is crazy. Like, that stuff's not real. It's never going to happen to you. You don't play in the NFL, the NBA. You, it's never going to happen to you. I'm just being honest. But porn lies to you because it makes you think that sex lacks work. It lacks work. Why is she taking so long in the porno? She just, the dude just said hi and it was over. But that's the demonic nature of porn. It's demonic because it trains you to not understand how God has wired women. I'm going to talk about that in a second. I'm not going to be in your way too much longer. Verse 18. He said, let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth. This is dope. This fountain be blessed is inherently uh, endowed with the capacity to please you. That's the beauty of the sexual relationship. When it talks about um, taking uh, pleasure in the wife of your youth, look at verse 19. He says, like a loving deer and a graceful doe. This is an illustration of a desire for sex that we don't relate to. So it's hard to really culturally bring the transfer to it. But this last part just breaks it down real clear. It says, let her breast always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. That's, that's good Bible right there. Now, it's either hypercatastasis or metonymy. He's, it's not reducing women to their body parts. It, it, it's using her breast as a euphemism to, as a part for the whole. So basically, he's telling her satisfied here can be translated either... Um, uh, uh, exhilarated, a, a even better translation is intoxicated. In other words, this is the only time the Bible tells you you can get drunk off of your wife's body. The Bible says get lost in your, bo- your wife's just enjoying the fullness of sex in your marriage. Y'all, y'all's quiet on this part. And so w- what does it mean, fellas? A few things. Number one, get yours. That's it. Get yours. Get Get, get yours. But then also make sure she get hers. Oh, y'all, y'all by yourself. Okay. So where is that in the Bible? The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That means um, I'm going to be extremely blunt. You shouldn't have an orgasm before her. Serve her sexually first. Give her multiples. Then you have your situation, because you know when you have yours, it's over. <laughs> it's over. It's just, the, the, the room just changed. Shoom! Until next time, it's, just, it's, it's over. It's, it's over. Don't act like I ain't telling the truth. Because <laughs> the gospel demands that you please her first. That's what the gospel demands. That's what Jesus demands. So in other words, don't be giving out any weak sex. That's it. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, thank you. (laughs) So let's talk about types of sexual interaction. I can't get into Song of Solomon too deep now. But there are two types of sexual interactions, longies and quickies. Now, they said, Pastor, you you wild in the mug. Listen, (laughs) but this is important for you to understand. Quickie, the, this is the issue with quickies. They're good, but quickies aren't, shouldn't be a marital lifestyle because quickies, in, it, 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 it doesn't help for the intimacy in the marriage to develop, okay? Because women are crockpots, not microwaves. So most men, we th- you know, like, I'm ready, yeah! you know, and you come, and she's like, no, nah, I'm not. And why? Because sex for her starts here. So she's thinking about everything she's asked you to do during the week. I know I'm preaching. I ain't even, I don't even got. So what you do, you go take out the trash. Go wash some dishes. Go take the clothes to the laundromat or put them in the wash. Amen. Pay some bills. You know what I'm saying? So I'm putting these clothes in the wash, girl. You better watch how I'm putting these clothes in the wash. She said, you better take care of them dishes. She said, you better take care of them dishes, boy. (laughs) 
<laughs> but guess what? Whatever your wife's love language is, you better serve the heck out of it. Because guess what? You go in the bedroom, she's like, hi, right? Why? And then, <clears throat> but you have to learn that it can't always, on the other hand, be longies. Because you can't, you, you, if you have toddlers, that ain't going to work. Yeah. Oh. Let's hurry, 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 because the baby going to wake up. You got to, parents know what I'm talking about. So, <clears throat> the, a, a few sensitive things that I want to encourage you with. Don't rush her to commit sexual acts that she's not ready for. Because sometimes you've had some stuff done to you in the past that you want her to do right away that she's not used to and doesn't see sexually as redeemable yet. And you need to be able to be patient with the process of her getting there. Same thing on the other side. The other thing is this. There is no, like Eddie Murphy said this one time, I almost had a heart attack. He said, I like to sneak sex. Now, I'm like, what does that mean? While my wife sleep, I have, that's called a charge. Is you crazy? You, 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 if your wife said no before y'all went to bed, it doesn't mean yes at three in the morning while she sleep. That's called rape. If y'all are in the act and she gets uncomfortable and you and, and y'all have already started and she says no, anything after no is rape. Next, if your wife has been raped in the past or has been molested, be patient with her comfortability in marriage. You gotta be you gotta be patient with the process because your patience will pay dividends later. Instead of, instead of shaming her about what well, that wasn't me and I didn't do it, so I just, what is about? No, when, no, 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 no. You are destroying her because you're called there first to shepherd her, not to sex her. That's first. And so you're just gonna have to ask God to give you pre- premarital sex self-control to be able to stay there and be invested in your wife. Um, lastly, and I'm done. He says, verse 21, for the ways uh, for a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes and he considers his path. That means God pays attention to your sex life and he watches. And so Jesus Christ, guess what? He frees us up to have great sex. He died on the cross to restore our relationship with him and with God and with one another and also in our marriage. The one another includes our wife. So Christ restores our ability to have the best sex we can have because the best sex is Christian sex because it's connected to God. And the Holy Spirit can show up like he did Elkanah and Hannah. You know the Holy Spirit showed up during their sexual union? You know that God showed up between Adam and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah's sexual union, opened the womb. That means he showed up and he wasn't against it. He was for it. Just a few things. This is, I didn't put this in the vision presentation, but this is part of the vision of a Fishmany Fellowship. What I want, what I dream of, and what I envision is more handsome men coming to the church. More handsome men of all ages and hues coming to church, getting saved, hallelujah, and marrying godly women. And the vision is for you to have a bunch of sex. That's the vision of the church. How many of you are on board with Epiphany Fellowship's vision? Somebody listen, I'm joining the church today. The doors of the church are open, right? But that's the vision I want to see. I want to see, I, I'm sick of hearing bad sexual stories. I just want to see people, godly people, getting married and just have a bunch of good sex and be smiling, coming to church with their Bibles, work through their arguments, work through their stuff, and just love each other for life. And just have some healthy, godly relationships. And I pray that everybody that desires to be married, God provides a spouse for them. That's, 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 the, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not exalting marriage. I'm praying for what you want. 
And don't come up to me and tell me, what about the single? But you the single person that told me you ain't got to give the singleness. And you told me to pray for you that you get married. Now that I preach a sermon to help you to get married so you can have a proper relationship. Don't be trying to rebuke me about us not focusing on singles because I'm not just focusing on singles. I'm focused on both marriage and singles. So listen, just chill out, calm down. And you already been asking for prayer. Now I'm helping you by preaching a sermon on sex so you can actually get the person in here so you can actually get in a relationship. So the real frustration that you really have is not with singleness. You're not having sex. And so now I'm praying that you would get married. And I'm talking about from 18 to 80. I'm praying 80 year olds come down the aisle, you know, together, you know. I'm praying they come down the aisle, get mad. Hallelujah. Sister Sheila, you wild and the Sister talking about, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All the way in between. I'm done, y'all. Let's go before the good Lord. Lord God, you are amazing that you care enough about us um, to show us your enjoyment.